taking their name from a spoiled female character from the 1960s book Charlie and the Chocolate Factory, Veruca Salt would be synonymous with 90s alternative rock. If you guys didn't know, Veruca Salt also had one other meaning which the band didn't know about. Apparently, it's a plantar wart found on the bottom of one's foot. The band would be once profiled by the British publication New Musical Express with the headline Wart This Way. Veruca Salt were at one point one of the most hyped bands to emerge out of the mid 90s, so much so that they suffered an enormous amount of backlash. Today, let's talk about the history of Veruca Salt and whatever happened to the band. Veruca Salt's history would begin in January of 1992 at two separate New Year's Eve parties. One New Year's Eve party took place at Louise Post's house where she was singing and playing guitar for her attendees, or as another story put it, playing a recording of some song she just demoed in a studio for her guests. The stories seem to change based on what you read. Her guests were impressed with her musical work and her talents, and one of the guests who attended her New Year's Eve party was actress Lily Taylor, who also happened to be friends with another woman named Nina Gordon. She would call Gordon from Post Party and hold up the phone so Gordon could hear Post singing and playing, and Gordon loved what she heard, and the pair met shortly afterwards, with one publication claiming they once attended the same Wendy and Lisa concert. Soon enough, the seeds of Veruca Salt were planted. Both Post and Gordon bonded over their love of Prince, The Beatles, Donovan, My Bloody Valentine, The Velvet Underground, and Joni Mitchell to name a few. Both women came from families whose parents played music and eventually got divorced. Post would take solace in pot smoking by the age of nine to deal with her parents' divorce. Gordon, meanwhile, would make up an alter ego and tell people she was born with jaundice and had a pet spider monkey because she wanted to be anybody but herself. Gordon seemed interested in music but almost reluctant at the same time. Overwhelmed by music theory, she tried to learn guitar and piano when she was quite young, but she wasn't really able to grasp those instruments early on in her life. She soon wanted to become a singer and leave the instrument playing up to her bandmates. She'd end up going to college and majoring in arts history and literature at Tufts, despite initially thinking about actually taking music. It was in college that she finally learned guitar thanks to her brother Jim Shapiro, who would teach her the instrument over the phone by telling her where to place her hands on the fretboard. By the way guys, if you're wondering why her and her brother have different last names, it's because Nina took her mother's maiden name, but she was unable to find a band and do gigs. Louise Post, however, would be instrumental in getting Nina Gordon out of her shell, and she was almost a missing piece to her life. Post had already played guitar, she was a singer, and had been in bands and done a bunch of gigs, and she seemed like much more of an extrovert. She would major in English literature, in college attending Bernard College in New York, and the plan following school was for her to either become a full-time musician or an actress, and well, she chose music. At Luis's insistence, the pair soon started practicing five times a week and played Chicago area coffee houses doing folk music, and they were once introduced by an MC who mistakenly referred to them as Luis and Naomi. They would spend nine months together playing coffee houses and they would show each other songs that they had written and they started to figure out harmonies as well. But there came a point where the pair wanted to expand to a four piece, initially envisioning enlisting an all female rhythm section. They would put an ad in the paper and the only person to respond was a bass player named Steve Lack who would eventually join the band. Needing a drummer and having no luck for months, they looked to Nina Gordon's brother Jim Shapiro he had never played drums before, but he was a songwriter at heart and had played in bands before and done gigs, but he was a huge John Bonham fan and he agreed to give the drums a try. He would learn drums by listening to Led Zeppelin's album Physical Graffiti and tried to emulate what he heard. Shapiro for his part had recently attended Yale studying English and at one point contemplated giving up music, but he kept tabs on how his sister's band was doing over the years and eventually decided to pursue music once again. Contrary to what people may think, Nina and Louise are not huge fans of Charlie and the Chocolate Factory. In fact, they were sitting around Nina's apartment one day and she had the book and they scrolled through the pages and they liked the name Farouk Assault. But they also identified with the character's attitude of going after what she wanted and not being apologetic for it. Post would tell the Missoula Independent, we're boldly going where few women have gone before and we are punished for it. People punish women for being in the spotlight. We haven't been stalked, but we have been leered and jeered at. Just as Veruca Salt solidified their lineup, Chicago's music scene was getting a lot of national attention, thanks to groups like Urge Overkill, The Smashing Pumpkins, and Liz Fair. Post would tell the LA Times about the band's early sound, saying, 
We considered our sound dreamy and ethereal until Jim started playing drums. He took it to a new level. He's very hard hitting. Veruca Salt would play their first gig in the Chicago neighborhood of Wicker Park around July of 93. Wicker Park was Chicago's ground zero for the independent music scene. One of those early shows saw the band even open for a Fleetwood Mac cover band who played rumors in its entirety. They soon started building a following playing popular Chicago night spots like Lounge Axe, Elbow Room, and The Empty Bottle. But by New Year's Eve 1994, they were opening for Liz Fair at a local club. The band from the start really wanted to get an indie label to sign them. With Post telling an interviewer, we were kind of scared of a major label. We wanted to relax when we made our first album, less pressure. The band would spend a good amount of time rehearsing and writing together before a local funk band named Uppity took Vrook Assault's demo tape to local label Minty Fresh. That demo tape contained four songs, and not on the demo tape was their future hit single Seether. Minty Fresh had previously signed Liz Fair, and the company was run by one guy, a man named Jim Powers, and Powers was 30 years old, and he ran the company out of his apartment, and he got his logo from a 1950s era railroad cocktail napkin. Powers had previously been an A&R guy for Tools label Zoo Entertainment, and prior to that, he worked as an A&R guy for Sony, where he signed Cowboy Junkies. Powers wanted Vruka Salt to do a local showcase for him before he agreed to sign them at a local festival he was booking in Wicker Park. Thankfully, one of the planned acts dropped out, and Vruka Salt was able to take their spot. Impressed, Powers signed Vruka Salt and Minty Fresh, and the band got a buyout clause in their contract. They would record the single Seether, All Hail Me, which would be released in March of 1994. Seether would be born out of a violent urge that Nina Gordon had mid-conversation with somebody. She would tell the Calgary Herald, I was sort of shocked by that impulse and I actually had these cinematic flashes in my head, what I would do to that person, and I was terrified by that, and I went home and wrote the song. There was only 2,000 copies of the single released, but it blew up almost immediately on local Chicago radio and college radio, and it also ended up on K-Rock in Los Angeles, and Veruca Salt nabbed a spot at South by Southwest the same year. The band up until this point had only played nine shows, and the appearance of South by Southwest garnered mentions in Billboard magazine and other national press outlets, and MTV, in a pretty strange occurrence, actually solicited a video from the band for the song Seether. The Star Tribune would write about the band, and I quote, Major label talent scouts and music journalists swarm the band's showcase. Suddenly, Veruca Salt, a group with no album and almost no stage appearance, was the country's hottest unsigned act. The group's exponential rise saw Veruca Salt get some positive press, but they were met with a ton of sniping from the media and jealousy, as well as suspicion from their own hometown of Chicago. Getting back to Minty Fresh Records, label owner Jim Powers knew people in the local music scene, including a producer named Brad Wood, who owned his own studio. Wood had previously recorded Liz Fair and Sunny Day Real Estate. Wood at the time was short on cash, but Powers cut a deal with him where he would pay the producer $5,000 up front, allowing the label owner to come back at some point in time and record 14 tracks at a studio. Given the reaction to the Seether single, Powers would use that $5,000 to record Veruca Salt's debut record titled American Thighs. American Thighs would be recorded in just 10 days, and the album would take its name from the ACDC song You Shook Me All Night Long. The title would deal with the objectification of women's bodies. American Thighs would be released by Minty Fresh in September of 1994, and soon major record labels were salivating at the thought of signing Veruca Salt. The band would eventually sign with Geffen Records, who would reissue their debut album, and they put a lot of marketing muscle behind the record as well. From the time that Veruca Salt formed to when they actually signed with Geffen was about 13 months. It was widely reported in the press that Veruca Salt was signed to a half a million dollar five album deal to the label. See, they would go on to peak at number eight on the Modern Rock Tracks chart. A lot of people initially thought the song was written about a woman's privates, and maybe all the cats in the video didn't help. But in reality, that wasn't what the song was written about. Some in the press showered the band with praise, Entertainment Weekly profiled the band under the headline America's Most Wanted, while the British weekly periodical Melody Maker paid the band a visit in their hometown of Chicago. Spin Magazine, meanwhile, proclaimed American Thighs as one of the top 10 albums of the year. But the band also received a lot of hate, and they really did not like the flood of criticism that came with the news that they'd signed with Geffen. The band were branded as sellouts, record industry plants, and even accused of writing the coattails of groups like Nirvana, Liz Fair, PJ Harvey, and The Breeders. One paper would even write, and I quote, it's hip to bash Veruca Salt. 
The critical backlash, especially in their hometown of Chicago, resulted in the band members admitting that their early live shows were not good since they lacked confidence as a band. It wasn't until they spent about 18 months on the road promoting their first record that they finally started to feel comfortable in the live setting. American Thighs would end up going platinum, moving a million copies. The band would tour with Courtney Love's outfit Hole and the band Live when promoting their first album. The comparisons to alternative rock bands weren't really helped when in 1996, the band put out an EP enlisting producer Steve Albini. The EP titled Blow It Out Your Ass is Veruca Salt. The album's title and cover was an answer to critics who slagged them off over the past two years. Veruca Salt would return in 1997 with their second full-length album, Eight Arms to Hold You, which would be inspired by the Beatles' alternative title for the movie Help. Metallica's go-to producer for the 90s, Bob Rock, and a strange move would be enlisted to produce the record. The band wanted to work with Bob Rock after being on tour with Live in 1995. It was during sound checks for that tour, the sound guy would test the PA system for that night's show using Metallica's song Enter Sandman. The band loved the production on the song and decided that they needed to work with Bob Rock and make a big polished rock album. Baruch Assault also claimed that they were sick of the alternative rock label and wanted to avoid the more obvious choices like Brendan O'Brien or Butch Vig. It also helped that Veruca Assault shared the same management with Metallica, making it easy to get in touch with Bob Rock. Veruca Assault's second album also saw them change the way they approached songwriting. They tinkered more with percussion and other sound effects, and by the band's own admission, Nina and Luis came up with different guitar parts rather than doubling what the other person was playing. The album would produce another big hit in the song Volcano Girls that would be inspired by the band's grueling touring life. The album, however, wouldn't be as commercially successful as its predecessor. The album would once again contain references to past failed relationships with the song Straight being a plea to a boyfriend to stop smoking so much pot, while The Morning Sad deals with being in a constant state of depression. But cracks were starting to form in the group around the time of them recording their second album. Years later, Gordon would recall, We understand that people want to know the gory details. Just watch the Fleetwood Mac behind the music. It was drugs and cheating and all that junk, and the two of us not talking about what was really going on. Soon enough, one by one, the members left, and by 1998, Louise Post was the only remaining member. Gordon left to pursue a solo career, while Shapiro, who was originally a songwriter, wanted a bigger role in the creative process. Adding to the mix was Louise Post's relationship with Dave Grohl of Foo Fighters being in turmoil. Post would announce to a crowd during an Australian show that Grohl had cheated on her with actress Winona Ryder. Post was left to pick up the pieces following her bandmates leaving and being dropped by their label. Post soon hired new band members and found a new label, returning with Veruca Salt's third album, 2000's Resolver. Post would come back in 2006 with the album 4 and continue to tour until 2012 when the band finally went on hiatus. Gordon, meanwhile, had some success in her solo career when one of her songs, Tonight and the Rest of My Life, would be featured on the TV show Charmed, as well as a trailer for the movie The Notebook. Post and Gordon hadn't talked since the pair went their separate ways in 1998, but that would change around 2003. The pair started exchanging emails due to business dealings, and they slowly rekindled their friendship. And by 2008, both women were now mothers and bonded over that life-changing experience. Soon the topic of playing music came up. In a strange twist, it would be Mazzy Starr, who appeared at Coachella in 2012, that convinced the women to reunite. It would culminate with all four original members meeting at a restaurant and offering roundtable apologies to everyone. Eventually, a reunion of the original lineup would be announced in 2013. As if everything hadn't come full circle already, the band would go back to Minty Fresh Records, who was still around, and work with producer Brad Wood and put out a new single at the time. They would release their first album together with 2015's Ghost Notes, which was well received. The band has also become politically active, championing causes that are close to their hearts, but sadly in 2018, it was revealed that Veruca Salt was one of many artists who lost their master recordings in the infamous 2008 Universal Fire. In June of 2022, Louise Post would release But I Love You Without Mascara, Demos 97-98, which featured several unreleased demos that were recorded between the release of the group's second and third record. That does it for today's video guys, thanks for watching. As always, if you have suggestions for future topics, use the link in the description box below. Take care.